Well, good morning. Great to be in the Lord's house. I am thrilled you're here. I started last week a series of messages entitled, You Asked For It. I never want to be answering questions that nobody's asking. And the Word of God's relevant for everything we're facing today. So I took your top five questions that people said they wanted to know about. Number one was heaven. And that makes sense. We're going to spend more time there than we are here. We should know something about it. Number two was forgiveness. Four out of five people have somebody they need to forgive. Four out of five say, I've got somebody I need to forgive. I dealt with that Sunday at five. Today, I want to talk to you about what does the Bible teach about death? What does the Bible teach about death? I want you to take your Bible, your iPad, your iPhone, whatever you have. You stand and we're going to open God's Word. We're going to open God's Word and see what the Scripture says in 1 Samuel chapter 20. Verse 3, this is what the Bible says. It says, And David swore moreover and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. David said, there is but a step between me and death. And by the way, there is but a step between you and death. And there is but a step between me and death. Let us pray. Jesus, I love you. I pray that you will speak to us and through us. Meet the needs of your beautiful people. And God, for all you do, we'll bow our heads and we'll give you glory, honor, and praise. For I pray this prayer with a grateful heart. For I pray this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. There was a man that was uh, extremely, extremely depressed. He had been sick for some time. He goes to the doctor. The doctor realizes how severe he is. Tells the man to go out in the foyer. But when you go out in the foyer, be sure and tell your wife to come in. I want to talk to her. The wife comes in. The doctor says to the wife, your husband is very, very sick. He's critical. This could be fatal. She says, Doc, do you have any recommendations? He said, yes, I do. Every morning, he needs to wake up to the smell of a delicious breakfast. Perhaps ham and eggs and fried potatoes. and just, uh, he just That's what he needs to wake up to every morning. After he has his breakfast, you tell him how wonderful he is. As he goes off to work, you send him off to work with a kiss. When he gets home from work, you meet him at the door. You need to be dressed in a very nice way. You need to meet him at the door and you need to remove his shoes. You need to run his bath water. After he has a bath, you need to make sure he has a delicious meal. After he has that delicious meal, a soft massage. Turn back the bed covers and make sure he has a wonderful, wonderful evening. And begin. <laughs> and begin the same thing the next morning. She storms out of the office, walks out into the foyer. The husband said, what did the doctor say? She said, that doctor said, you're going to die. Reality is we're all going to die. They released some new stats this week concerning death. It was very interesting. These are the new stats. One in every one dies. <laughs> Hebrews 9 and 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 and 12 says, Wherefore is but one man sinner into the world, and death but sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Ladies and gentlemen, we're every one going to die. And you had so many questions that you said, Pastor Benny, would you answer about death? So you asked for it, and I'll do my best to deliver it from what the Bible teaches. See, let me, let me tell you something. I'm not smart enough to teach anything but the Bible, but I'm too smart to teach anything but the Bible. It's God's Word. That's really all that matters. First of all, what does the Bible teach about 
reincarnation. Reincarnation, that's a rebirth into another body. You say, well, Pastor, why would you even address that? Because 25% of Americans believe in reincarnation. The Buddhists believe in reincarnation. The Hindus believe in reincarnation. They say it explains why homosexuality happens. Because said perhaps the person was another sex in the previous lifetime. Well, the Bible teaches resurrection, but the Bible doesn't teach reincarnation. See, 42 times in the New Testament, the Bible teaches resurrection. But zero times in the Bible does the Bible teach reincarnation. And what disputes reincarnation more than anything else is one verse, Hebrews 9 and 27. And it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. You don't die and then die again (laughs) and then die and die again. Shirley MacLaine said that in a previous lifetime, (laughs) she was a water buffalo. (laughs) True story. And maybe there's not that big a contrast between her and a water buffalo. I don't know. (laughs) But here's what I know. It's appointed unto man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. So it's not true. Now, the Bible and soul sleep, what what is soul sleep? Well, soul sleep says that when a person dies, the body goes back to the dust of the ground, but the soul becomes unconscious. It just becomes unconscious And it's unconscious till Jesus comes back. Well, what does the Bible teach? Well, in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, there was a rich man died. There was a beggar died by the name of Lazarus. There was Father Abraham, and they were all conscious. They were talking. So they weren't soul sleeping. And then in 1 Samuel 28, verses 13 through 15, Samuel was dead. And then this unique occasion, I don't have time to elaborate the story, but Saul conversed with Samuel who was dead. And he was not soul sleeping. So the Bible doesn't teach soul sleeping. Now what about the Bible, Pastor, and purgatory? The Roman Catholics, the Greek Orthodox, believe that there's a place called purgatory. That is, that when a person dies, most are not bad enough to go to hell or good enough to go to heaven, so they go to a place called purgatory. And by the way, let me just make this injection and I'll preach. Folks, you're not going to go to heaven on the basis of how good you are anyway. You're not going to go to heaven on the basis of what you do. See, every religion of the world says do. Do, do, do. But Christianity says done. Jesus paid it all. It is finished, paid in full by the blood of the Lamb. (laughs) Not any good about us. The good is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. But I want, you to, I want you to understand something. Purgatory means to purge. And the teaching is that when a person dies, there are things in their lives that can be purged by the prayers of their loved ones, by doing charitable works. And I'm not trying to offend anybody. This is a traditional teaching. It's a historic, traditional teaching. But there's no biblical basis for it. And the Bible says, and it came to pass that the beggar died. And he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. I don't mean this wrong, folks. It's heaven or hell. There's no intermediate. 
There's no second chance. Remember what Jesus said? He said, remember to that rich man, in thy lifetime. It's what we do in this lifetime, folks. It's what you do now. It's what you're doing right now that's going to matter. Number four, what does the Bible teach, Pastor, about cremation? An old businessman was on his deathbed, and he called his friend to come to his side. Bill, he said weakly, I want you to promise me that when I die, you'll have my remains cremated. Yes, my friend, I will, he replied. And what do you want me to do with your ashes? Just put them in an envelope and send them to the IRS. <laughs> right on the envelope. Now you have everything. <laughs> in 1980, less than 5% of people were cremated. Today, 50% of people are cremated. Do you realize that in Japan, the land is so valuable to bury a body is illegal? And 98% of the people in Japan are cremated. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The Bible never condemns cremation. The Bible never condemns cremation. And uh, it matters not if a body's burned to death, <laughs> if a body's been eaten by wild animals. <laughs> God knows the location. <laughs> and uh, and he, can re he can resurrect that Adam, amen? No matter where it's at. So you say, my loved one was cremated. And if they knew Jesus Christ, the wonderful news, and you know Jesus Christ, you're going to see them again. Amen? You're going to see them again. Now, I do believe there are some biblical reasons for burying a body. I, I, I do believe. You say, Pastor, uh, what, uh, why would you say that? Well, simply because of the Scripture. Abraham was buried, and Sarah was buried, and John the Baptist was buried, and Ananias and Sapphira was buried, and Stephen was buried. This one probably sums it up. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 34 that when uh, Moses died, God buried him. <laughs> what did God do when Mo died? He just buried Mo. He buried Mo in a place where we don't even know where it's at. Do you realize what burial is symbolic of? Uh, cemeteries. You know what that word cemeteries means? It means sleeping places, sleeping places. Well, look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In the early days, I said to our people, that's the verse I want to make sure we put in all of our nurseries. Amen? We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Okay. Okay. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall re be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Jesus was buried. By the way, folks, last Sunday at 5 o'clock, right there, we baptized 38 people. And you know what it's symbolic of? Death, burial, and resurrection. That's what a baptism is symbolic of. Death, burial, and resurrection. So the Bible and cremation. Can a person be cremated and go to heaven? Why? Sure. Do you think there's some basis for being buried? I personally do. Number five. Do some people get a glimpse of heaven before they die? Do some people get a glimpse of heaven before they die? I heard about one guy who had surgery and he woke up from the surgery and the blinds were pulled. He was so upset. He said, my goodness, who pulled those blinds? It's so dark in this room. And a nurse walked in and she said, I did. I did. She said, they're burning a building across the street and I didn't want you to wake up and think the surgery had been unsuccessful.
Do some people get a glimpse of heaven before they die? Sure they do. I've been with people who did. I've been with people who said, I see mom. I see dad. I've been with people who said, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I want to go. I've been with people. But it's not enough, folks, that I've been with people. What's enough is the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us in the book of Acts that Stephen looked up and saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Sure, some people get a glimpse of heaven before they die. How can we enjoy heaven? How can we enjoy heaven if we have loved ones not there? How can a wife enjoy heaven if her husband's not there? How can a husband enjoy heaven if his wife's not there? How can children enjoy heaven if their parents are not there? Well, God's going to purge our minds of the memory of that lost loved one. And it's not enough that I said it. Look what the Bible says. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Friend, if a person goes to heaven, they'll not remember that loved one that didn't make it. See, the other night when we baptized 38 people, I said, Pastor, do, did those, do those people in heaven know about it? Well, the Bible says this. The Bible says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Apparently, the people in heaven know about the good things that are going on down here. There's joy in the presence of God over one sinner that repenteth. Number seven, can a person commit suicide and go to heaven? Can a person commit suicide and go to heaven? I want you to understand something. There were seven people in the Bible that committed suicide. God never condoned it. God never condoned it. It's looked upon as a selfish act. But I have to say, suicide's not the unpardonable sin. And if God forgives all sin, ladies and gentlemen, and we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, God even forgives suicide. This is what I truly believe. We're judged on our faculties. James 4 and 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Notice, therefore to him that knoweth. I've never been convinced that when a person makes that decision, they have their full faculties. Number eight, but the answer is yes, you can go to heaven and commit suicide. You say, I disagree with you. You're entitled to your opinion no matter how wrong it may be. <laughs> how old? <laughs> how old will we be in heaven? Now listen, I tried to be biblically sound on everything. I tried to be biblically sound on everything. But this is requiring some speculation. Adam and Eve were created at an optimal age. They were created an age in which they could have children. It's believed that they were at the physically strongest age. Adam and Eve, that's the way God created them. Jesus went to the cross when he was somewhere around 33 years of age. Resurrected. He was known. So apparently there were some physical things that were still intact. So somewhere around 33 years of age. The Bible says in Philippians 3 and 21, who should change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. This requires speculation. <laughs> How old's a man going to be in heaven? 33. How old's a woman going to be in heaven? 29. Pastor has no concrete proof for what he's saying. Amen. <laughs> Number nine, 
Can homosexuals go to heaven? Can homosexuals go to heaven? I would prefer to, <clears throat> that was the question I was asked, but I would prefer to ask it like this. Can those involved in sexual sin go to heaven? Let me say some things. <clears throat> All people, matters not. All people are welcome at Rock Springs Church. <clears throat> All people are loved. All people. I don't, it matters not. <clears throat> I went through a situation, I've told this story many times, but I was running on a road. <clears throat> and I had some people very close to me <clears throat> that were involved in a lifestyle. And I said, I don't know <clears throat> if they would be welcome in my house. Getting around the holidays, and I said, I don't know that they would be welcome in my house. I'm just running, talking to myself. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, they might not be welcome in your house, but they're welcome in mine. And I'm talking about my personal home. This is not my house. This is the Lord's house. But can a person, can a person, a homosexual, can a person in sexual sin be, go to heaven? And the answer is yes. Let me show you a scripture. Let's go to the scripture. And, and see, folks, here's a catcher. For a long time, we've used homosexuality as the whipping post sin of the church. That is, we take a strong stand on homosexuality and we beat those individuals up. But we know we've got kids in the youth group that are sleeping together and nobody says anything about it. Yeah, and we've got, we've got men and women who are being unfaithful in their marriage. And having improper relationships, but yet we won't say anything about that. And somehow we've equated that you can have an improper relationship with someone other than your wife. And that's somehow okay, but homosexuality is so wrong. I've got a Greek word for that, baloney. Let's look at what the Bible says. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God. By the way, somebody said, Pastor, I need to know where you stand. Listen, you don't need to know where I stand. You need to know where God stands. Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality. You say, well, now, boy, that's a, that's a corrupt group right there, Pastor. Well, wait. Wait, wait. Look who he puts in there with them. Are thieves greedy people? So he puts greedy people and homosexuals and male prostitutes together? Are drunkards? So he puts the drunkards and the male prostitutes and the homosexuals together? Don't shout me down when I'm preaching so good. <laughs> or abusive? Or cheat people? You know you owe somebody money? You know you owe it? And you don't want to make it right? And God puts you in the same area? as male prostitutes, homosexuals, sexual sin, because you cheat people? If I'm in the book, say amen. amen. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. But wait. Now this is to the Corinthian church, by the way. Some of you were once like that. 
<laughs> he said, my church, the church here is just made up of a bunch of messed up people. <laughs> and folks, you know, every church is made up of a bunch of messed up people because that's us. That guy beside you that looks so dignified, he's so messed up. She's so messed up. Oh, she looks like she's a member of the Paint Lemonade Sipping Society, but she's so messed up. If you knew some of the thoughts she has, it'd make a sailor blush. <laughs> this was what you all were. Oh, <laughs> that's what we was. That's what I was. But wait. <laughs> but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. <laughs> Pastor Benny, can a homosexual go to heaven? Can a drunkard go to heaven? Can a male prostitute go to heaven? Oh, the answer is an affirmative yes. But let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus wants you to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus wants you to be filled by his spirit. And Jesus wants you to come out of that lifestyle and say, no, I'm not living that way. I've been set free. I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, you don't have to be controlled by that. You can be free because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And if God be for us, who can be against us? <laughs> Number 10, what happens when a Christian dies? What happens? I, I heard about a, this is a cemetery in Indiana. True story. This is on the gravestone. Paul, stranger, when you pass me by, as you are now, once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. And somebody took a permanent marker and wrote below to follow you. <laughs> I'm not content. Until I know which way you went. <laughs> what happens, pastor, when a person dies? I want to know. I was with my dad. I was with my mom. What happens when a person dies? Well, let me tell you something. If they're a Christian and you're in the room right before they die, don't think it's strange if you sense the presence of angels. Amen. Don't think it's strange if you're in the room right before a Christian dies and you sense the presence of angels. Because see, here's what happens. According to Luke chapter 16, verse 22, angels come and they escort that person <laughs> into the presence of God. Because see, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And when they take their last breath here, they take their first breath in heaven. <laughs> when they take their last breath here, they take their first breath in heaven. And the struggles and the trials, they're over. Because that soul and that spirit takes the bold in a temporary body. You say, where, where are my loved ones right now? Well, first of all, they're with Jesus. And they're in a temporary body. They're in a temporary body. They're in heaven. They're with Jesus. They're in a temporary body. How do you know, Pastor Benny, they're in a temporary body? Well, look what the Bible says. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah. This is so good. Jesus said, I want to tell you guys how it's going to be. He takes them up to the Mount of Transfiguration, and we go there when we go to Israel. 
And he takes them up to the mount and he transfigures before them. <laughs> He's in the glorified body. And nothing's in the Bible, folks, just to be in the Bible. Peter, James, and John, they're standing there and Jesus transfigures before them. Read it. Do you folks ever read the Bible? But anyway, hey, hey, I mean, he, he transfigures before them. And there appears Moses and Elijah. You say, well, why, why Moses and Elijah, Pastor? Well, keep in mind, Moses died. Remember, God buried him. We talked about it. But what about Elijah? He didn't die. God took him to heaven in a whirlwind. So one's dead. One didn't die. What does it symbolize? It symbolizes what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. Look what Thessalonians says. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of our kitchen, and with the trump of God, and the Moses in Christ shall rise first. <laughs> then the Elijahs, which are alive remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. What's going to happen, Pastor? When Jesus comes back, that cemetery right out there, it's going to burst open because glorified bodies are going to start coming out of the ground. And they're going to meet the Lord in the air. And those glorified bodies are going to be reconnected with a soul and spirit to forever be with the Lord. Lastly, and I'm done. What happens, Pastor, when an unbeliever dies? Well, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 16. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, saith Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Understand something. Hold it right here. He didn't die and go to hell because he was rich. He died and went to hell because he was lost. But he lifts up his eyes and he sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. I think the most horrible thing about hell will be when a person goes to hell and then they can look and they can see loved ones in heaven and they didn't make it. And by the way, Every person who doesn't make it. Somebody said, if you miss heaven, you've missed it all. No, you hadn't. There's a place called hell. I know preachers don't preach about it anymore. But it's still in the book. I know it's not popular. You're going to emotionally disturb people. You're going to lessen your crowd. I'm not worrying about lessening the crowd. I'm worrying about pleasing God. I'm worrying about standing before God. This rich man knew unequivocally why he went to hell. I can prove it. Look what the Bible says. I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they come to this place. He said, I don't want anybody to come here where I'm at. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Look what he said. But Abraham, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He knew unequivocally why he was there. It's because he didn't repent. He didn't put his faith in Jesus Christ. Billy Graham lived to be 99 years of age. Billy Graham was asked, what was your greatest surprise about life? He said the brevity of it. The brevity of it. You know what life is, folks? Sometimes we get to thinking we're everything in a bag of chips. That the world can't make it without us. What's going to happen when I'm gone? Preacher, I'm so valuable to people here. What are they going to say 30 minutes after I'm dead? Right here. Pass the potato salad. <laughs> Here's what we are.
That's what we are. That's what we are. You, you want to know what your life is? It's just a vapor. And it appears for a little time. And then it's over. That's my life. That's your life. Too busy to read the Bible. Too busy to wait and pray. Too busy to speak out kindly to someone, by the way. Too busy to care and struggle to think of life to come. Too busy building mansions to plan for the heavenly home. Too busy to help a brother who faces the winter blast. Too busy to share his burden when self in the balance is cast. Too busy for all that is holy on earth beneath the sky. Too busy to serve the master, but not a one of us too busy to die. I don't want to make a church member out of you, but I want you to know something. Eternity is too long to be wrong. You need to know that you're right with God.